thought it was very interesting this morning that every song was about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to prepare to do a series here this morning and probably next Sunday morning called Jesus, the name above every name. I'm asked uh, when people knock on my door, some with white shirts and ties, other ones come dressed to the nines and they want to tell me all about who they think God is one of my favorite things to do is who do you think Jesus is what do you say about him amen so I looked in my Bible and looked up all the names in scripture uh, for Jesus and I asked the Lord to help me put it together in poetic form I'd like to read it to you and then I'm going to go back And we're going to cover every scripture that this talks about. Amen? So, Father, uh, as, as I present this, help us to meditate on you. Lord, it's not about anyone else but you. Who is Jesus? And I ask that you help us today to see your glory, your power, your grace, And the fact that you are the mighty God. I pray you'll help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. He is the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the great I am and the holy one. My redeemer from afar. He is Jesus, my savior. He's the first and last. He is the Lord of all. So on him, my soul, I cast. Jesus is the anointed one, and even so much more. He's the beginning and the ending. Forever, he's the door. The beloved son, the blessed one, and the bishop of my soul. Righteous branch, bread of life. Only he can make me whole. He's the bridegroom and the bright and morning star. The captain of my salvation. He came from heaven's shore. He is the chief cornerstone and the door for all of God's sheep. Chief shepherd and counselor, and he promised my soul to keep. He's the deliverer, eternal life, so faithful and so true. He's the faithful witness, the glorious Lord, my God, my Savior too. The good master, the great high priest, and the blessed son the heir of all things, the holy child, the just and holy one. He's our hope of glory. Emmanuel, yes, Jesus Christ, my Lord. He's the king eternal, king of glory, king of all the earth. He's the lamb of God, the light of the world. He bought my second birth. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah and the living bread, the Lord of glory, the Messiah, and the firstborn from the dead. He's the master, the most holy, the mighty God is he, the only begotten of the Father, and he's the Prince of Peace. He is the great physician and the power of my God, the resurrection and the life. He's righteous judge, he's my rock. He's the Rose of Sharon, my Savior. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of David, the sure foundation, the one who paid my price. Jesus is the true vine, the blessed truth, and the God who makes us free. Jesus Christ, our Lord, he is Lord indeed. Amen? Amen. So what I want to do, I don't think I'm going to be able to finish this today, but I'm not in a big hurry. I just want to be led by the Holy Spirit and go over every one of these things. Amen? So he's the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. If you turn with me to Revelation 22 and verse 16. Those of you who wish to turn there, and if you don't wish to, that's fine. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. And I am the bright and morning star. Amen. 
He's also the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you'll turn with me to 1 Timothy, those of you who wish to. 1 Timothy, all your T's are together in the Bible. Right after Thessalonians, you'll find Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. Now, there are a lot of people in our world who claim to be kings and lords. There's a lot of people who like to lord things over people. But we serve one king and one lord. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only powerful. The king of kings and the lord of lords. Who alone has immortality. Dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see to whom be honor and everlasting power amen he's the great I am and the holy one and he's our redeemer let's turn with me to Isaiah 59 Isaiah chapter 59 you know when God gets all the glory when his name is lifted high he will draw all men unto himself. That's the bottom line to why we meet in church, is to be lifted up, to be encouraged to serve and honor our God. Amen? And he is to be highly lifted up. He is my Redeemer. Isaiah 59, verses 19 and 20. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, then the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. For the Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, praise God. He's Jesus, my Savior. He's the first and the last. Revelation chapter 2 Verse 13 and 14. You know, one of the things I've discovered in my walk with the Lord, the Bible's true or it's not. So we believe the whole Bible or we believe none of it. And we, we place our faith and our whole life on Jesus Christ the Lord and on his word. His word is true. In fact, Romans chapter 3 and verse 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. So I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you've got to listen to this prophet. You have to listen to this preacher. You have to listen to that preacher. No, let God be true and every man a liar. I know there's some good preachers out there, but I'd rather hear it straight from him. Amen? Revelation 2, verse 13 and 14. God says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Verse 14. But I have a few things against you, because you have those there who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Verse 16. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone there will be a new name written, which no man knows except the one who receives it. Amen. He's the first and the last. He's the first one to speak and the last one to speak. He is the Lord of all. Acts chapter 10, verse 36. I know there's people, uh, especially in our country, who believe that they are the Lord of all. And they put heavy burdens on people. But Jesus is the Lord of all. He's the Lord of them. And anytime he wishes, he can close his hand. 
He holds the breath of every man in his hand. And any time God wishes, he can close his hand. He is the Lord of all. Acts chapter 10 and verse 36. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, for he is the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of us. He's the Lord of our nation. He's the Lord of our life. Jesus is the anointed one. That's what the word Messiah means, the anointed one. So let's go to Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7. And God's going to tell a story here today through the names of Jesus. Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It is a scepter of righteousness, the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. We talked about the meeting in heaven last week. We talked about how righteousness and peace kissed each other, how mercy and truth met together. And uh, the scripture says here, God, your God, has anointed you, showing again the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The begin he's the beginning and the ending, and forever he's the door. I know some people are struggling figuring out what way do I go now? What place do I go now? Where do I find a job now? What do I do? If you'll recognize Jesus Christ as the door, in all kinds of scriptures, God says, I am the one who opens the door and no man can shut it. God is the one who opens the door because he is the door. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me, all, all means all, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. David talked about that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. If we go through Jesus Christ, he is the only door. He is the door. He's the beloved son and the blessed one. He's also the bishop of our soul. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 24. Right after the book of James, you'll find 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Who himself bore our sins. Man, singing that song, How Great Thou Art. He died to take away my sins. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray. Church, I was a sheep going astray. You were a sheep going astray. We were like sheep going astray. But now we have returned to the shepherd and bishop or overseer of our souls. God is our overseer. We have people who are over us in authority, but God is the ultimate overseer. He's the ultimate bishop of our souls. He is the bread of life. John chapter 6 and verse 35. I have to laugh sometimes. Sometimes I get an opportunity to go onto YouTube to uh, look at people who run up and down in the flesh, run across the platform, get people all fleshly excited, jumping up and down. 
And then they walk out of church and they say, oh, that was a great sermon. I loved it. And you say, what, what did he preach on? Uh, well, it was just great, you know. Okay, so what did you get out of the message other than jumping up and down in your flesh? Amen? It's not about that. It's about bringing Him glory and honor and praise. For He alone is worthy. He's the bread of life. John 6 and verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And, who, and he who believes in me will never thirst. We will never hunger or thirst spiritually. But we have to come to him. Amen. One of the ways I've learned to come to the Lord is not only in prayer, but in his word. He speaks to us through his word. It's amazing what God can show us if we'll take time to look into his word. I like this one. He's the bridegroom. We are his bride. He is our husband. John chapter 3 and verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. Does he have you? Does he have you, church? Amen. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled when we hear the voice of Jesus. Amen? He's the captain of my salvation. That means a lot to me. I had a captain when I was in the Navy. He gave me some great news one day when the Vietnam War was ending. He said, half of you in the room are going to be going out to sea. We're going to change your rating. And half of you are going to go into the reserves. My hand went up. <laughs> He's the captain of our salvation. We had to obey our captain. Whatever he said, we had to do. And so the captain of our salvation, how much more? How much more? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. I would much rather preach the word of the Lord than to throw out my own ideas. My ideas aren't worth much, but God's word is everything. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Now we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, and then was crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many souls to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. We don't really understand or know what suffering is. Jesus suffered for us. We will never face death. We will leave our body, but that's not death. Death is to be separated from God eternally. We'll never have to face that because of what Jesus did. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the chief cornerstone. If we're ever going to build on anything, we build on the cornerstone of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we build our life upon. The cornerstone of Christ. There are many in our nation and in our world that build, their cornerstone is money. I don't know why you would choose dead presidents for your cornerstone. Because when you look at money, they're all dead presidents. So we choose Jesus Christ for our cornerstone. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. We were in Hebrews. If you just go to your right, you'll be in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture. Behold, God says, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. We will never have shame 
when we trust in the Lord Jesus. If the enemy tries to put shame or guilt on you, it's not of God. God does not put shame or guilt on anyone. God convicts us, and the conviction that he gives us draws us closer to him. Satan puts shame and guilt on people and pushes them away from God. That's, that's not of the Lord. We will never be put to shame because he is the chief cornerstone. He's also the chief shepherd. I know a lot about shepherding. My grandfather had a sheep ranch in Utah, and John Mafiodakis was the sheep herder. We all thought he was crazy. Uh, we used to call him Crazy John because uh, my uncle would go out with a rubber hose and try to get the sheep to all gather in the pen, and all they would do was scatter. And John Mafiodakis would go out and mumble in Cretan. Uh, that's a form of Greek that's spoken about three times faster. And he would go out and just mumble in Cretan and walk, and all the sheep would follow him right into the pen. And it's amazing to me that the chief shepherd knows how to take care of his sheep. Amen? He knows how to take care of us. As a pastor, sometimes I get concerned about people who arrive and seem to be excited for the Lord, and then they disappear, and then I'll call them or text them or try to get a hold of them, and they'll avoid me or they'll avoid the church, etc. It's concerning, but I thank God that the chief shepherd knows how to get to them. The chief shepherd, I've, I've adopted this after over four decades of ministry. I've learned not to chase people down. I've learned to let God deal with his people. My job is to bring the truth and to love the people. And uh, for, for those who get discouraged and, well, where's so-and-so and where's so-and-so and where are they at? I haven't seen them, etc. Don't worry about that. Just love the ones that are here. Love the ones that are in front of you. Amen? The ones that aren't here don't want to be here. And when they do want to be here, they'll be here. If they're not here, just love the ones that are here. Amen? And that'll, that'll keep you happy. That'll keep you satisfied. And it'll keep you looking at yourself. How am I doing, Lord? What, what, what am I involved in? Is it okay in what I'm doing here? Am I following you? I need to be concerned about me. Amen. Amen. Chief Shepherd, 1 Peter 5 and verse 4. I want to start with verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort, who I am also a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. You are to shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, and not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those who were entrusted to you, but being example to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And God has made each one of us leaders, people who watch us, who look at us. You're shepherding someone. Make sure that you shepherd them with love and care as the chief shepherd does. Not only is, not only is he the chief shepherd, but he's our deliverer. God has delivered me. I hear people saying, well, I think I'll try this program. I think I'll try that program. I think I'll go to this program. Why don't you go to Jesus? He'll deliver you. Amen? Amen. Jesus will deliver you. I love Pastor Joe's story. Uh, he talked about just every day of his life, uh, when he became an adult, was filled with beer and bars and all of this kind of stuff. And when he got saved, it stopped. All of it stopped right there. God delivered him. I smoked cigarettes for 13, 15, 15 years. Camel cigarettes, three packs a day for 15 years. When I turned 28 and got saved, God delivered me from cigarettes. I did make the Wrigley Gum Company rich, but, but I didn't smoke cigarettes anymore. And you know, it was a sign to me, my dad died of lung cancer. My Uncle Johnny died of lung cancer. My Uncle Jim died of lung cancer. My Uncle Angelo died of lung cancer. My Grandpa died of lung cancer. Duh! There's your sign like t times ten. You know, so the Lord showed me this is not your body anymore. You've been bought with a price. You were to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which now belong to God. 
You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to God. He's our deliverer. He can deliver us. Romans chapter 11. We don't want to put our faith in some man to deliver us. God will deliver us. God uses people, but God is the one who delivers us. Amen? Romans chapter 11, verse 26 and 27. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He w- and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins, says the Lord. God has taken them away. He's delivered us. Be delivered. Amen? Be delivered. The faithful witness and the glorious Lord. Isaiah chapter 33. I think it took me longer to type this than to preach it. Uh, Isaiah 33, verse 21 and 22. But there the majestic Lord will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams in which no gallery with oars will sail nor majestic ships will pass by. For the Lord is our judge. He, the Lord, is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Amen? Amen. I love it when someone will come up to me and say, gee, I don't think you're qualified to do this or that or the other. And all I say to them, I'm not going to argue with people. I just say, "Can can I see your hands? What for? Well, In the flesh, I'd like to slap them, but just say, can I see your hands? They hold out their hands, and I go, just as I thought, no holes. No nail holes. He's our judge. He's our Savior. He's our deliverer. Amen. He's our glorious Lord. And he's the good master, and he's the great high priest. I speak. 17 years of my life, my first 17 years, going to the Greek Orthodox Church where I saw the priest every Sunday. And he would, it was always a mystery to me, he would go behind on the, on the platform and go through a door and then shut the door. And he would be back there, I don't know, whatever they do back there, and then he would open the door and come out and leave the door open. It was a picture. It was a picture of the fact that the high priest, the great high priest, came through the closed door, went and suffered for us, was buried, and rose from the dead, and left the door open for us. It's just a picture. He is our great high priest. Hebrews chapter 4. So last thing I think we were in, Peter. Hebrews 4, verses 13 and 14. The scripture says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. And we thought we could hide at night. (laughs) There is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession because we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but he was in all points tempted just like we are but he was yet without sin therefore let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need anytime we ask how do we do this run to the throne ask God how do I do this Sometimes the Lord will say, I'll do it for you. Other times the Lord will say, wait upon me and I'll show you how. Other times God will put it in your mind what to do. But run to the throne first. Amen? Run to the great high priest first. The Bible says he's the heir of all things. And he's the holy child. Acts chapter 4, verse 26 
Acts, the fourth chapter, and verse 26. Now the kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were all gathered together. But they were gathered together thinking they were doing their own thing. No, they weren't. Verse 28. To do whatever your hand, Lord, and your purpose determined beforehand to be done. That was God's purpose. I used to get angry at the Romans because they crucified Jesus and pounded nails in his hands. And I was thinking, those rotten Romans, why would they do that? And the Lord told me, you're the Roman. It was your sins, my sins, your sins, that put Jesus on the cross. God just used the Romans to get him there so he could die for us all. Church, don't be discouraged because he's our hope of glory. He is our hope of glory. I don't know what 2024 is going to hold, but I know who holds 2024. And I know that he's not going to allow anything to come upon us other than that which is common to all men. But God, with those kinds of trials and temptations, will provide us a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. That's what his word says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God will provide the way. Amen? Amen. He's our hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, the book of Colossians chapter 1, right after Philippians. Colossians 1 and verse 26. Now the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, it has now been revealed to us, his saints. What's that mystery? Well, to them God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That's the mystery. The hope of glory. Christ in us. That is the mystery that was hidden from people for ages until Christ rose from the dead. And then he said, I'll send the Holy Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. I like this too. We have a lot of kings, a lot of presidents. You can usually see on their tombstone, born on this day, died on that day. All the kings and presidents die. They all die. If, if you don't believe me, just look at all your money. They're all dead. Every one of them has died. But Jesus is the king eternal. The king eternal. He is an eternal king that will never, ever die again. He died once for all, for all sins, and now he sits at the right hand of God. He is eternal. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Starting with verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I am chief. You ever wonder about that? Why the Apostle Paul said, I'm the chief sinner? Think about that. If the Apostle Paul was the chief sinner, he's the most spiritual guy in the Bible other than Jesus Christ. As far as the New Testament goes, as far as I'm concerned, he wrote 52% of the New Testament. He's called himself the chief of sinners. Where does that leave us? So I thought about that. How can he say he's the chief of sinners? Because I believe he was so close to God. Every little speck in his life showed up. I believe the further away we get from God, the more holy we think we are. And I believe the closer we get to God, the more of us shows up in the light and, and the more sin shows up. And there's a Bible verse that talks about that in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. The Bible says, If we confess our sins... God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. In other words, we come to God and we say, this is what I've done. I'm so sorry for what I've done. And God says, I will forgive you for what you confessed. But there's all this other stuff that you don't even know 
that's darkness in you that I'm going to forgive as well. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. So the King Eternal, 1 Timothy chapter 1, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has enabled me by, by counting me faithful and putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which were in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul said, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Christ Jesus might show all patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So what does Paul say? Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's the Lamb of God, and He's the light of the world. This world's getting darker, as John said up here very eloquently, I might say. It's getting a lot darker. But Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He is the light of the world, but He's given us His light to show the light among those who walk in darkness. So let's take a look at that, John chapter 8 and verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now there's an implication to that scripture. He who follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Because 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Verse 6 says, if we say we walk in the light, and we're walking in darkness, we're lying and not doing the truth. Verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Aren't you grateful that he's the light of the world? Amen. Praise God. We can walk in his light. He is not afraid because he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, just about every creature in the jungle is afraid of lions. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. We live in a jungle. They better fear him. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, in Revelation chapter 5, last book in your Bible, Revelation 5, verses 1 through 5. This is, uh, this is the scripture where the Lamb of God takes the scroll in heaven. They find this book and nobody can open it. And finally the Lamb of God shows up and here's how it reads. I saw in the right hand of, of him who sat on the throne a scroll that was written inside and on the back and it was sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And there was no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth who was able to open this scroll or even look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read this scroll or look on it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and in the midst of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. That means the sevenfold spirit of God. And sent out unto the earth. Then he, Jesus, the Lamb of God came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat 
upon the throne. If you've got something you can't open, go to the Lamb of God. He can open it for you. I've seen doors that were closed and I was told they'll never open. And I prayed and asked the Lord and I'm sure you've done the same in your life and God is the one who opens the door and no man can shut it. He's the Lord of glory and he's the Messiah. John chapter 4. This is the chapter where Jesus meets the woman at the well. And this is one of the only places in scripture where Jesus chooses to tell someone that he's the Messiah. This is, he, he didn't tell his disciples, I'm the Messiah. He didn't tell Herod, I'm the Messiah. He didn't tell Pilate, I'm the Messiah. He just told Pilate, thou sayest. But he told this woman who had been married five times and was living with a man at that time. He told her, I'm the Messiah. An amazing story, John chapter 4. We want to look at verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will not worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now the woman said to Him, Well, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ and when He comes He'll tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus picks the lowliest person he could find in a Samaritan village where the Jews wouldn't even speak to the Samaritans. He finds the lowliest person he could possibly find to tell he's the Messiah. What did she do with it? She ran back to her village and told everyone, I found him. I found the Messiah. He's the prophet we've been looking for. He told me everything I ever did. And I think that's what God expects us to do as well. He expects us to go and tell it on the mountain. As, the, as we sang this morning. We are to go and tell it on the mountain. He's not only the Messiah and the Master and the Most Holy. He's the Mighty God. He is God. For unto us a child is born, Isaiah 9, 6 says. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Did you know that the entire uh, Trinity is found in that verse? The entire triunity of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, found in that verse. He's Wonderful. He's Counselor. That's the name of the Holy Spirit. He's the Mighty God the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all contained in that one scripture. And he's the only begotten of the Father. People in cults would have you to believe, well, Buddha is one too. Well, uh, Allah is one too. No. God has one only begotten Son. Only the Jesus Christ. That's it. He's the only one. John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And then John writes in verse 14 of John chapter 1, And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of of grace and truth, the Lord Jesus. He's the great physician. Anytime I feel led that I might have to go to a doctor, I ask God first. 
do you want me to go to the great physician or are you going to use one of these other guys that are still practicing? Amen? God sent me to one that was still practicing one time. I was, I was uh, nearly blind and uh, I prayed and asked the Lord, show me, do I need to go to a surgeon or are you just going to heal me supernaturally? And the Lord led me to go to this surgeon who trains other surgeons to do LASIK surgery. And within less than a minute, I was totally healed. When less than a minute. Laser on this eye, I think, was like 23 seconds and 26 or 27 seconds on this eye. Less than a minute, totally healed. My whole life, couldn't see. My vision was 20-990. And within less than a minute, I was healed. I gave God the glory for that. And by the way, my surgeon was Jewish, but my father who sent him <laughs> knows all about Jewish people. <laughs> Amen? And I got totally healed. So I encourage you, church, rather than running to the doctor first, run to the great physician and ask him, what, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to go see? What would you like me to do? And wait for God to show you. He knows the best ones out there that are practicing. And sometimes he'll just say, no need to worry about it. You're already healed. Amen? Amen. And the days are coming when we're going to have to do that more and more. The days are coming. They're getting darker and darker. Persecution's coming. And the days are coming when we're going to have to pray to the Lord just about everything we do. We should do it now. He's the mighty God. He's the only begotten of the Father. And Jesus is the power of my God. He's the power. So take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Don't you love hearing about Jesus? 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, that's a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's why we run to him. Amen? Amen. All right. He's the resurrection and the life. I use these verses almost every time I do a, a graveside ceremony because it gives hope. Martha and Mary were not very happy with Jesus because their brother Lazarus died. He was sick. They called for him. Jesus let him die. He met Martha on the road and Martha said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She had angst in her heart towards the Lord. Mary stayed at home. She didn't even want to see him. Finally, Mary came and said, Lord, if you would have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. So Jesus says, where have you buried him? You don't think God knew where they buried him? <laughs> God wanted them, take me there, and I'll show you that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever is living and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? If you believe that, Jesus asked, do you believe that? If you believe that, you'll have victory in your life. Because even death cannot separate you from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the resurrection and the life. The Apostle Paul said it this way, I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything created, neither anything uh, in heaven or on earth, nothing created shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So death does not separate us. Leaving our body does not separate us. The fact of it is, according to Jesus Christ, in John eleven twenty six, whoever is living and believes in me will never die do you believe this? We will never die. You know, I don't know how long I'll be on this earth, but I will insist that in the newspaper, if there is anything, he didn't die. He graduated and went to be with his father. 
And when you think about death, think about this. We are a trichotomy. Body, soul, and spirit. The real us is, is our soul. And the spirit of God carries us. Our body is just what we're contained in. That's not us. Who I'm looking at is not you. Your soul is who you are. So the scripture says to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord. We have to be absent from our body in order to be truly present with the Lord in heaven. So when we, quote, pass away, in other words, when we shed our body, we immediately step into the presence of the Lord. We don't miss one beat, not one heartbeat. We literally step right into the presence of the Lord. I read a book, and I forget who the pastor's name was, but he said he was watching his grandmother in her last moments on this earth. And just right before she closed her eyes and breathed her last breath, she held out her hand and said, He's come for me. I'll see you there. And that was it. So God gives us so many different signs in, in, uh, in human history and other things to show us that to be absent from our body is to be present with the Lord. Praise God. It's the resurrection and the life. He's the rose of Sharon. He's my Savior. Is he yours? Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4, verses 9 and 10. Actually, I want to start with uh, verse uh, 6. 1 Timothy 4, 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. You are to reject profane and old wives' fables, and you are to exercise yourself towards godliness. Because bodily exercise does profit a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having the promise of life that is now uh, and of that which is to come, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things you are to command and teach. He is our Savior. Praise God. A couple more and we are going to finish today. He's my sure foundation. How about yours? Amen? When everything else is shaky, He's the solid foundation in our life. Folks, I'll let you down. I'm just a human just like you. You'll let me down. We stand on the sure foundation. That way we don't get let down at all. You know, people are people. We're all human. We all are weak and frail and we're made of dust. But God is a sure foundation. When everything else gets shaky in our life or in this nation, stand on the sure foundation. Amen? Isaiah 28, 16. When I was sitting in my office studying... I thought, Lord, what am I going to preach for New Year's? You know, we're going to, we're going to meet on New Year's Eve. Jesus said, what, how about preach on me? <laughs> Since I control the New Year anyway, how about preach on me? Amen. Isaiah 28. And verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation. It's a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And whoever believes will not act hastily. Sometimes, uh, especially during an earthquake, I've been through a couple here in California. All my relatives that live all across the U.S. Why would you live in California? There's earthquakes. Well, I've been here since 1970, and I've experienced two. They experience 
uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and everything else. Sometimes twice a year. And I tell them, well, in how many years I've been here now since 1972, 50-something years, 53, or it's 1970, 53 years, I've experienced two. And it's, it's shaky. And you kind of have a tendency to want to get out of that. But there's nowhere to run because everything's shaking. Run to the sure foundation. Run to the sure foundation. And when you don't know what to believe, which is kind of indicative of where we are in this country, <laughs> believe the blessed truth. Because Jesus is the blessed truth. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Uh, it's so funny. I was talking with someone the other day and they were saying, I don't know what to believe anymore. I mean, somebody said this and somebody said that. And, well, who do you believe? I said, I don't believe none of them. I just believe the word of God. Just believe what God says. Well, what does God say about that? Well, I'll tell you what he says. Brethren, we know that we're of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. So there you go. You know, that's what God says. Just believe the truth. John 14, 6. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Lord indeed. So let's close with a couple of scriptures here. Colossians chapter 3. And I'm, I'm going to leave uh, this. If you want all those scriptures, I'll leave it up here. And if you want to take a snapshot of it or take them or whatever you want to do, you're welcome to it. Colossians chapter 3. In fact, Jennifer grabs my sermons every time. And let them get a picture first. <laughs> I save them on my computer, so once they're written down. and I want to spread stuff out, amen? We need as much help as we can get. Amen. Colossians 3, verse 23 and 24. It's great instruction for me, great instruction for you. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So I learned this lesson when I was in my early 50s. I don't loan money anymore. I've lost too many friends. You loan them money and they can't pay you back and they don't want to talk to you no more. So I've learned, okay, I don't loan money anymore. If I have money and you need money and the Lord shows me to give it to you, I will give it to you. I can't loan it anymore. Because it makes people run away when they can't pay it back. So either give it, or if I don't have it to give, then I can't give. And I'll pray for you that God will get you what you need. Amen? But I've learned that. I've learned that. Whatever you do, don't do it for people. Do it for the Lord. If you do it for people, you're going to get discouraged. But if you do it for the Lord, you'll be blessed. And you'll be happy and joyful. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance because you are serving the Lord Christ. Amen? Let me back that up with a scripture. Uh, in Matthew 25, uh, some people come to Jesus and he goes, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And when I was in prison, you came and, and visited me. And when I was sick, you came to me. And they said, Lord... When did we see you sick or in prison or hungry or thirsty? And when did we do all this for you? And Jesus said this, Because you have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So whatever we do, we do it for the Lord. Doesn't matter who we do it for, we do it for the Lord. Amen? We do. First John chapter 5, verse 20, and we'll go ahead and close. Because that's what this sermon was all about. So, if you do have your Bibles, I would uh, encourage you to turn to 1 John 5. Right in the back of your Bible, right before 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. 1 John 5, and verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come. We know that. 
I haven't seen him. I didn't see him come. I didn't see him on the cross, but I know that he came. He has given us an understanding. Yes, he has. That we may know him who is true. Now, he's not talking about knowing about him. He's talking about knowing him. You really can't get to know anybody unless you spend time with them. Yeah, every Tuesday, as you know, I go for a motorcycle ride, and I'm really getting to know those guys that I ride with. I'm getting to know them, I'm getting to love them, because I sit across the table from them, and I look into their eyes, and I hear their stories, and we pray together, and we talk together. That's how you get to know somebody, amen? And so I've tried to do that with as many of you as possible, either come to your house or sit with you or invite you out for coffee or whatever it is to try to get to know you. Because to know you is to love you. So God has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and that we are in him who is true, even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. I don't know where the cults get that he's not. Uh, I have the JWs coming to my house and, oh no, he's not God. You guys worship three gods. I prove to them in their own Bible and they still can't get it. So thank God, church, that God has given you an understanding. He's opened your eyes. He's opened our eyes. He's helped us to understand who he is and that he is the eternal true God and eternal life. Amen? Would you stand with me? Wow, we did get through it. It's straight up 12 o'clock, praise the Lord. So nobody will be late for lunch. <laughs> Amen. You're welcome to come here tonight. Tonight we have, uh, for New Year's, we have just a regular Bible study. We're going to be teaching out of the book of Romans. And I think it's a very appropriate study for what we're going into in 2024. It's talking about how to deal with the snares of the enemy. How to deal with the hindrances that he throws in our life. So if you're available, you're more than welcome to come. And afterwards, we're going to have a little fellowship uh, in the back. Uh, we will not be here till midnight. So those, those who are interested in doing something else, you'll still have plenty of time. So Father, thank you so much for your word. I give you praise and glory for who you are. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You're wonderful. You're our counselor. You're our sure foundation. You are the lily of the valley. When there's no beauty around, you are the beauty that we look at. So Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we ask that you bless us as we go into this new year, 2024. Father, honestly, I didn't think I'd ever see the 2020s. I thought you were coming before then. But Lord, I thank you that you've allowed us to continue to go forward. I pray you will help us to be bold in our witness, to be loving in our approach, that you would give us wisdom and understanding as we speak to others and live out our lives before them. I pray a blessing over this congregation. I pray a blessing over 2024 for each and every one of us and our families represented. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy in pastoring this church for the last seven years. I ask that you please strengthen me and continue to help me to continue to bring forth your word and continue to help my brethren, your children, us, your sheep. Help us to follow you, Lord. And I pray that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And God bless you, church. Amen. Happy New Year. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Punishment that was due for our peace was laid on.